What went ye out for to see? A reading from Luke chapter 7, 19 to 35. Well, brothers and sisters and young people, it would be too much to ask you, of course, to remember our last class sometime last year, but we did deal with the raising of the widow's son at Nain, as recorded in Luke chapter 7. Hence, we're taking up the reading this evening because we're trying to do this study in chronological order as we go through the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. That miracle, brethren and sisters, of course, of raising of that boy created a tremendous great degree of interest around the region. We read in verse 16, And there came fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God had visited his people. And this rumour of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And so the excitement of the Lord's work began to reverberate around the areas until it finally echoed, brethren and sisters, on the, in the cell of John the Baptist as he languished under, the, of course, the imprisonment of Herod Antipas. And that would have been, of course, on the other side of the Dead Sea, where Herod had his fortress, as it were, his fortress prison at a place called Machaerus. And there John would have been incarcerated in the dungeon, deep down beneath that fortress, in a most, in a most terrible situation, brethren and sisters. And news of this wonder, wonderful work of the Lord Jesus Christ came to him in that prison. Now John sent two of his disciples to inquire as to whether the Lord was the one that they should look for. You know, I've heard some ingenious expositions of this section, brethren and sisters, in the endeavour to try and, you might say, protect the honour of John by saying, well, really, he didn't send those disciples uh, because he doubted, but of course it was for their benefit that they might also learn. Other people have said, well, it had to be like that because John saw the visible evidence of the Spirit of God descend upon the Son of God. He could be in no doubt whatever that this was God's beloved Son and the Messiah and therefore it couldn't have possibly been for his own benefit that he sent those two disciples. Well, that's very good philosophy, brethren and sisters, but I don't believe the context of these verses will fit that. I think the context is crystal clear. I don't think either that John necessarily doubted in that sense. But like every other man and woman in Christ, in circumstances of necessity, John sought for some reassurance. We do that, brethren and sisters. We do it sometimes ashamed of ourselves because we ought not to have those little doubts and sometimes without shame because we, we realise we do need as human beings those things of God to, to be regurgitated in our mind and our thinking that we might have a better hold upon the things which make for stability. I have no problem whatever in my mind of understanding John's attitude. I know he saw the Spirit of God. I saw the Six Day War. So did you. What's your life been since like, like that? What was it like in 1968, a year after? We've seen a lot of things, brethren and sisters. We've seen God's hand at work among the nations. We've seen Europe. Look at Europe. We see that. We're standing every day of our life and watching angels all as if they're visible. Does it make any difference? Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And yet for all the things we see, doubts creep in. And when you think about this man, languishing as he was in that dreadful position, with above him all that riotous living going on, which was of course to end in his death, never knowing what the next day would bring, not being able to communicate with the outside world except for the visit of his own disciples, and not being able to see the wonderful works of our Lord Jesus Christ, I can well and truly understand John seeking some assurance from our Lord that he was indeed the one that should come. Now in verse 21, the Lord didn't answer John, brethren and sisters, verbally. There was no verbal reply, immediately that is. All we read there that in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and their plagues, the evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. And of course you can add to that list that he had just raised a boy from the dead. And so all the miracles were performed in a almost a frenzy of activity in answer to the question of John's disciples. And, you know, that in itself was, of course, calculated to be an answer. And John would meditate upon that when he was told of the things that they'd seen and heard, and he would think to himself, well, the people flocked to hear me. They came out in their droves to the amphitheatre of Judea, and the record says of John he did no miracle at all. 
And yet the people came to hear him. And John would be clearly getting the message that here was one to whom the Spirit was given without measure. And whereas John had performed no miracle, yet the people had followed him. Look at this wonderful man that had come with the power of God. And God does not give his Spirit to sinners as the blind man observed some time later. The power of Almighty God in that way, brethren and sisters, is given in measure as the person who can receive it. And this man was given it without measure because he was a perfect man. And this frenzy of activity which Jesus engaged in was to impress John with that. And having performed those miracles, then in verse 22, the Lord Jesus Christ, then Jesus answering, said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. And that's an echo, brethren and sisters, of Isaiah 52 and verse 13. We won't turn that up. But Isaiah 52 and verse 13, all but one verse to Isaiah 53 concerning the suffering servant. But Isaiah 52 and 13 says that kings would shut their mouths at all that they'd seen and heard. And it wasn't only what they're going to be seeing, but what they were hearing, because Jesus went on to say this. He says, you go and tell him how that the blind see, how that the lame walk, how that the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and now, listen to this, to the poor the gospel is preached. You see, it wasn't only what they saw, it's what they heard that was important, brethren and sisters. Now when you think about that, and you think about the activity of our Lord, he mentions all those things which were being done physically. So he mentions the blind and the lame and the lepers and the deaf and, and the dead that are raised. And apart from all that, there's this expression, and under the poor, the gospel is preached. Now therein lay John's consolation. The Lord was ever like that, brethren and sisters. I suppose we've learnt that already in our studies, haven't we not? That whenever the Lord gave encouragement, he always gave it up to a point so that a person would have sufficient to latch their mind onto and to build upon the things that were told them. The Lord never, for example, really told everybody everything they needed to know but he gave them the privilege of working that out for themselves because when you have somebody wanting to help you who's wise enough with that, they will help you to a given point and then they will leave you to climb the rest of the road on your own because by doing it that way, you will be more helped than if they gave you a crutch to go the whole distance. And the Lord was like that. He ever said to men sufficient to spark in their mind a, a spark of encouragement and then to think about what they were told. To the poor, the gospel is preached. That, brethren and sisters, is Isaiah 61. This is what John's mind was directed to. I've got not a shadow of doubt in my mind that this is what the Lord was doing. That's Isaiah 61. And here was the, here was the message that John was going to get. Because you see, implicit in the message was, art thou he that should, should come, or do we look for another? Of course, implicit in that was, was this the time that John was going to be released from prison? He was really thinking about his own deliverance as well as the coming of Messiah, wasn't he? And so we read in Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me, because Yahweh hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. There it is. The gospel to the poor. And that's what he told John, that above, above all the physical things that have been seen, they heard him preaching good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And when John would have heard the echo of Isaiah 61, he would have known, as he thought about that, brethren and sisters, what was in that verse. But then he would think again. Because what is that verse saying? It's saying that this one who would preach good tidings to the meek or to the poor would also be the one who would open the prison gates to them that are bound. But when would he do that? He would do it, he said, in what is called here, the, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And so, brethren and sisters, those gates of the prison would spring open, but not now. And that's the message. And the gospel to the poor was that everyone would be free, but not 
today. It would happen in the year of Yahweh, the acceptable year of Yahweh, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, brothers and sisters, this is very clearly a reference to the Jubilee. Now, if you don't think that is right, just keep your hand on Isaiah 61 and look at Leviticus 25. And actually, Isaiah 61 is really echoing the words of Leviticus 25. You know what it said in Isaiah 61? He was to proclaim liberty. Well, here it is in Leviticus 25 and verse 10. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty. That's the words of Isaiah 61. And the year of jubilee, brethren and sisters, when they opened the gates of every man's inheritance and he returned from whatever poverty-stricken circumstances he was in, when he returned to his own inheritance, in the 50th year, we read in the ninth verse, Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. And that's the day of Yahweh's great national sacrifice, the day of his vengeance, really, for those who have never, ever bowed to, the will, to his will and accepted the great sacrifice that he's made. And so John was told to go back, or his disciples were, to go back and tell him that he would preach to the good tidings to the poor. He would talk about the opening of the prison to them that are bound, when the kingdom would be set up, and then would come the day of God's vengeance. And that's what's going to happen, brethren and sisters. And when our Lord Jesus Christ returns again, as he certainly will, and he stands on the, on the slopes of Olivet and splits that mountain and views that city, he will bring down the sword of Yahweh, bathed in heaven upon all the heathen that are round about that city. And there will be a dreadful execution of Yahweh's wrath and the day of his vengeance. And from that day, he will proclaim, brethren and sisters, the year of Yahweh's acceptance. He will proclaim that wonderful year. And then, then, of course, will go forth that message to all the world and men will be liberated from all that binds them today in all the superstition and in all the desires of the body. Everything that binds men and women, they will be released from that. And John, in that day, brethren and sisters, will come out of that prison. Not, of course, on the day that the Lord stands on the slope, because he will be with him, we know. But in that epoch of time, John himself will be finally released, not simply from Machaerus, but he will be released from the body of death itself, the opening of prison to them that are bound. And Jesus said, you tell John also, you go back and tell him, blessed is he that will not be offended in me. And that's one of the reasons why I believe those words, that, those, that, that question was John's question. The Lord would never have said that if that wasn't John's question. And in a very gentle, not a rebuke, brethren and sisters, but in a very gentle exhortation, he would tell those disciples, now you go back and tell John, don't, don't stumble over me. Blessed is the man that doesn't stumble over me. Look at some of the blessings of Isaiah 61, brethren and sisters. You imagine John getting that exhortation from his disciples. And as they come back into that dungeon and they tell him that They'd seen these wonderful miracles and to the poor the gospel was preached and his mind would revolve around that opening of the prison and the acceptable year of Yahweh and knowing that there was his answer, this truly was the Messiah, but the day had not arrived and John would have to go the way of all men and he would be comforted and then he would think about the blessing. Verse 6, you shall be named the priests of Yahweh. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall you boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double. And for your confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. And so on and so on. And that chapter abounds in the latter portion of it with those wonderful blessings that will accrue to those poor to whom the gospel was preached. And brethren and sisters, John had this marvellous distinction. A distinction, I think, that in all our opulence and the way we live, we can scarcely ever appreciate. He had this marvellous distinction that he was the poorest of the whole lot of them. If the good news were preached to the poor, he was number one in poverty. And therefore, he'd hear that gospel ringing in his ears. 
He would listen intently to that message of exhortation. He would accept, I believe, in faith and in confidence that he'd have to go the way of all flesh. This is not the hour of deliverance, but it's coming. And when that prison gate would be opened, he he would know that for his shame he would have double. And as he would no doubt hear the echoes of the raucous laughter in the riotous way they lived and the feasts that were held in that place and the Gentiles gorged themselves on this world's good, he says, He would listen to the words, ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And he would think about that. And I believe that he would calm himself in those circumstances. And when they sent the executioner, he was ready. I believe he would have been ready. And when you come back to Luke chapter 7, brethren and sisters, we have here an exhibition of the Lord's feelings. In verse 24 we read, And when the messengers of John were departed, He began to speak unto the people concerning John. Now, in the Greek, brethren and sisters, they they tell us that the tense is in in the imperfect tense, and so we'd read that, and as the messengers of John were departing. And you can, I think, fairly fairly certainly infer from the context of the words that follow the scene that that would have faced our Lord, that he would have been, I believe, acutely aware that as he was talking to these two disciples of this very great man, that there would be a large crowd of people listening to what was going on. And the Lord would be very much aware of their presence and knowing that they would hear what he had to say to these two disciples. And as the disciples swung on their hill and walked away from him, and I can just picture this scene, that as they went away, he would turn his eye to this smug crowd who would by that time be thinking to themselves and probably whispering one to another, Well, you'd never believe it, would you? That a man like John, with all his stern denunciations of others on the banks of the Jordan, and with all the privations of life which he had endured at that point of time, and with the golden voice and the wonderful exposition of the scripture, you would never believe that he had such human weakness. And this smug crowd would perhaps be discussing this matter And their estimation of John may have been lowered somewhat in their mind. And our Lord could not stand that, brethren and sisters. He could not stand that. And I believe that their smugness would be wiped off their face in a flash when they, when, when he swung on them and they would have seen our Lord in one of his rare moods of righteous anger. And that would be, brethren and sisters, a sight to behold. And he had every reason every righteous reason to be angry with that crowd. And yet, you know, as he launched into them in a dissertation which must have absolutely scorched them to their heart, he never lost his call, he never lost his direction. And I want to show you as he went through that blistering speech that he made to them, that he had an objective and he was able to compose himself at the end because he had an objective to reach and he reached that objective and achieved it, brethren and sisters. But even in his anger, But it's fairly obvious that these words would have been spoken with great intensity. What went ye out to see? Note what he said. He didn't say, what went ye out to hear? And yet what we know about John, above all else, brethren and sisters, was his voice. That's what we know about him above everything else. When they questioned John about who he was, And the more he said, the less he said. I am not the Christ. I am not. No. They said, what are you? He said, I'm a voice. He was something in his estimation only in the abstract. And that was the main feature of his life. He was the voice, all right. In the wilderness, crying out, prepare ye the way of Yahweh in the wilderness. That was what he was. But you know, it was Luke who said that he was in the deserts until the day of his showing unto Israel. Showing! So it's more than a voice. And the word in the Greek means exhibition. And so Jesus was right. He was in the desert from the day of his exhibition. So it wasn't so much now what they heard that mattered. It's what they went out to see. And the day is going to come, brethren and sisters, when we're going to be faced with this sort of thing. And when we stand before our Lord Jesus Christ, be too late then to be talking about what we heard, it'll be a question of what we see. And what will we see? We'll see a perfect man. The measure of all men, really. 
the one who died and tasted death for every man, the man against whom we should measure ourselves and not by ourselves or among ourselves. And it's what we see that day will count. But too late for he to listen to what's been said. And that's the case here. Never mind about what you heard, said Jesus. What did you see? And as he looked upon that crowd and looked upon the various people that were there, and the way they were dressed, he, his anger would rise up in his bosom as he would think to himself, what right have they got to think anything of John in a disparaging way, even though he may have sought comfort in a moment of trial? What right has anybody got, brethren and sisters? I can give you some examples in this ecclesia of that, of recent days, of people's lives who have been absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful, and have left a stamp upon this ecclesia that I believe that we ought to be ashamed of, many of us, and yet some of those people have their temporary lapses, and there's gossip about their weakness. We don't ever think about all they've done over the years. And I'm not talking about myself, nothing to do with me. I know who I've got in my mind. And it hurts me to the quick to hear those criticisms of people who momentarily may lose their concentration perhaps, may have their moments of depression in life, and may manifest some pettiness and weakness, like we all do. And quickly, in a flash, we've forgotten a lifetime of devotion of care and nurture, of loveliness. Like that. That's what we like. We're all like that. Petty, a whole lot of us. And Jesus would have swung on this crowd. They'd forgotten in a flash John the Baptist. They were quickly reminded, brethren and sisters, what went ye out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Did they? Did they go out to see a reed shaken in the wind? A man, brethren and sisters, who was swayed by the blast of popular opinion? Did they? Think again. Let us take their minds back to the Jordan. When the self-righteous, supercilious Pharisees came there, dressed in their gorgeous robes, did he spare them? Was he a reed shaken in the wind? Did he bow in deference to their greatness? Did he care for popular opinion? He did not. He tore strips of them in public. What did he do with the soldiers, the brutal soldiers who turned up with their weaponry? leaning on their spears and their swords as they peered down over the wilderness of Judea. Did he quail, brethren and sisters, before the muscle and might of Rome or the mercenaries that gathered there? He did not. He fronted them up straight to their face and told them what they ought to be doing about their wages, a sensitive issue among soldiers and the publicans and the crooks that came. Did he, brothers and sisters, spare them anything? He did not. What about Herod, Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, who had married his brother Philip's wife? Did he tell him that it was all right because he was courting favour with Herod? He did not. He fronted him up not once, not twice, but continually. It cost him his life in the end. What went ye out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? I tell you. A man in soft raiment, says the Lord. Is that what you went out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? I won't tell you, brethren and sisters, exactly what that Greek word has been used for. Sufficient to say this, it's used of men who are effeminate. And he'd be looking at that crowd, a crowd that he called itself an adulterous generation, whose sins reached to the sky. And he says, you went out and saw an effeminate man, did they? Look at him, brethren and sisters. There never was such an exhibition of manliness as they saw there. Living in the rigours of the desert, prepared to accept that for Christ's sake, for God's sake. Living a life of privation when everybody else had a wonderful life to live. Breathing the fresh air and eating nature's goodness. Was that an effeminate man? And look at some of this crowd that that were laughing up their sleeves at him. The Lord could scarcely have restrained himself, could he? He says, did you go out to see a man gorgeously apparelled, he says? Behold, he says, they that are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. And in among that crowd, brethren and sisters, was exactly that class. There was a class there called the Herodians. And they were formerly scribes who had the honoured task of ascribing the law of God for other people into parchments and to interpret that law 
the honourable task they had of marking their Bible, as it were. And for that purpose, they were marked out in Israel dressed in pure white. But some of them, that wasn't good enough. And they changed that, brethren and sisters, for uh, the more opulent gowns of the courts of Herod, the purple, the royal purple. They lived delicately in king's courts and they were traitors to the Jewish cause. Nay, they were traitors to the word of God which they had been given the great privilege to us to scribe and they'd become traitors to that. He said, did you see John like that? How was he clothed, brethren and sisters? How was he clothed? Now he would think of it. The Lord would be talking to him in verse 26. But what went ye out for to see? You see, he repeats that. Why? Because you see, he knew that all the people believed that John was a prophet. It says that. That all the people counted John as a prophet. So, so the Lord says to them, what went ye out to see? A prophet. And they'd all start thinking to themselves, oh, goodness. Well, here's a justification. Yes, we really do believe John was a prophet. So we've got something on our side. A prophet, he says, not good enough. Not good enough. A prophet, more than a prophet. You imagine them real under that glass. So you think you're paying deference to John, do you? So you think you're doing him an honour and a privilege because you think he's a prophet? I'm telling you, you don't know the heart. He's more than a prophet. What could be more than a prophet, brethren and sisters? What could be more than a prophet? And they'd be thinking that. Was he the Messiah? No, says Jesus. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. You see, brethren and sisters, all the prophets prophesied of the coming of the just one. But John stood there and introduced him. That's more than a prophet. You see, all God's, all the greatness that's attached to men according to the commendation of God is based upon the relationship they have to his son. Whether they were prophets before he came or whether they were disciples who lived afterwards. Every man will be in the kingdom, brothers and sisters, saved by God's grace, not by his own righteousness. But there will be degrees of reward, won't there? Because there are degrees of faith. And all those degrees, from top to bottom, will be evaluated on the basis of Jesus Christ. Nobody else. Nothing else. That will be the sum total of the evaluation. Well, if the prophets were great because they prophesied of the coming one, what about the one that stood there and introduced him? Their evaluation was not as to which was the greatest prophet, which endured the most, who spoke the better, who lived the better life in that sense. Their evaluation was in what relationship did they stand to the Christ? And none stood in the relationship that this one did. Because that's what Jesus said, you see. This is he of whom it is said, Behold, I send my messenger before thy faith. He shall prepare thy way before thee. That's John's greatness. He's not talking about him as being the greatest of all the prophets because he was the one who lived the best. That's not the point. It's his relationship to the Son of God that was greater. That's the point that he's making from Malachi chapter 3. But you know, brethren and sisters, that crowd would have been absolutely thunderstruck by those words because if you look at Malachi chapter 3, that's not exactly what Malachi said. Jesus didn't put it like the prophet put it. And as he claimed this wonderful honour for John, he didn't exactly quote what Malachi said. Malachi had said this. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. But Jesus said, Behold, I will send my messenger before thy face, and he shall prepare thy way before thee. And the people would think to themselves, as they're watching the Lord Jesus Christ, all right, they thought John was a prophet. They were mistaken. He was more than a prophet. They had not evaluated him properly. Far from criticising him for his lack of faith, they hadn't even in the best days evaluated him as his real value. And not only that, brethren and sisters, now they're listening to a man who's saying to them that in the words of the prophet it says, I will send, he will, uh, he will prepare the way before me, that is Yahweh. The Lord quotes that in the third person as himself, before thee. This is the prophet that's coming before me, he said. As if the prophet there was talking in the words of God, 
speaking for Yahweh, that there would be a prophet that would go before Yahweh, and that Yahweh was here, way above their evaluation. And so the Lord's word would have had a, an absolutely powerful impact upon them. And then the Lord said this about John. He says unto them in verse 28, And I believe, brethren and sisters, it's, this is my opinion, I think it's strongly rooted in the word here, I believe at this point our Lord's whole attitude changed. I believe as the people reeled under that blast, he would have changed his attitude. He had, a, he had an objective to reach. His objective was not to destroy those people, but to try and get them to see a necessity for change in their life. And therefore, I believe the whole tone would change in verse 28. He would probably stop, take a breath. He would be calmed in spirit. And then very deliberately he would say, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And what he was really saying, brethren and sisters, that there were people in that crowd, in a certain respect, greater than John. Now you might find it hard to believe for a moment, but I believe that's what he meant. That having put them right in their place, he's now going to encourage them. Now you just think what he said. Among those born of women. Now that is a qualifying phrase, brethren and sisters. It qualifies the Lord's eulogy of John. How great was John? How truly great was he? Well, among those born of women does duty for two ideas. One is that there was not a prophet that was anywhere near him. He was the greatest of all the prophets, because they were all born of women. None are excluded. That's point number one. But point number two is this. The expression, born of women, is only found twice in the Bible. And we have to be guided, brethren and sisters, by that usage. And Job says, he that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. And he went on to say in the same book, in the next chapter, in chapter 15, that those that are born of women, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No, not one. And so born of women means that nobody is excluded in Jesus' comparison of, who, of how great John was. But it also, brethren and sisters, means this, that John was the greatest, the last and the greatest of a transient system that suffered human weakness. There were things going to happen beyond that which were going to reveal men and women to be in another sense greater even than that. That's what Jesus is saying. And that expression, born of a woman, is the qualifying expression. So he was the last and the greatest of a transient system subject to human weakness. John was truly that. As one of the writers, Matthew, says, the law and the prophets were until John. Now you think about that, that's Matthew 11 verse 13. The law and the prophets were until John, which means that John was not put in the category of the prophets. See, the law and the prophets were until John. He was more than a prophet. He wasn't just tacked on as the last prophet in that sense. He stood alone. He was unique. He was Malachi, my messenger. He was more than that prophet. But, said Jesus, those who are least in the kingdom of God are greater than he. And he was talking to that crowd. And if we could paraphrase our Lord's words, we probably as the crowd reeled back with red faces, with shame for having even thought for a moment that John had manifested any form of weakness, thinking now, being forcibly reminded of the one they went and saw, and being ashamed of themselves, Jesus was virtually saying to them, look, it's true what I'm saying. He is the greatest. There is none. None, everyone that has been born in the, in the line of the prophets, there's none excluded. He's the greatest of them all. And yet, he was born of a woman, like we all are. But there are people standing here that are listening to me. And they are in that, in my presence, in the presence of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, he said on another occasion, is among you. Luke 17 and verse 20. Is among you. Least in the kingdom of God. 
is greater than he. And he was talking, brethren and sisters, about those people. That if John's greatness, if John's greatness, relative greatness, was relative to the Messiah, to whom he introduced, here I am, and there you are. And you are standing in a position of greatness greater than that. You listen to the first of Peter, chapter 1, brethren and sisters, and you see how Peter makes a similar point about our relationship to the gospel as compared to the prophets. You listen carefully, and it's, it's the same principle here in the first of Peter. And in the first of Peter, chapter 1, note the words the apostle has to say, verse 10. He says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what, or what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. What's Peter saying? He's saying, look, there were the prophets. They searched what or what manner of time. In other words, they didn't always understand the body of their prophecies, and they certainly didn't understand the time periods that there would be the sufferings and the glory that would follow, because the prophecies are all over the place. There was never really any sequential ideas in many of the prophecies like that. There were in some places, in other places it was reversed and so forth. And so the prophets were in a quandary. And they learnt, says Peter, they learnt that what they were speaking was for the sake of another generation. You! And God sent his Holy Spirit upon us, the apostles. What for? To enlighten us for our own personal benefit? No, for your sake, he said. And it takes us think, uh, one step further, he says, and in that respect now, the prophets were your servants, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles to make them your servants, to enlighten you people, to have a knowledge above the angels. Now that's what Peter's saying. That's our privilege. And we're not worthy of it, brethren and sisters. Doesn't mean to say that any of those people standing there will supersede John in the kingdom because they won't. Or any of the prophets. John will have a far greater position in the kingdom than any one of them. That's not the point the Lord is making. What he is saying is this, that all the great men that God has raised up were not raised up to be made great in their own right. They were raised up, every single one of them, to help somebody else to be great. And so the Lord encouraged that crowd with those words. And when we go back to Luke chapter 7, You notice the reaction of the people, brethren and sisters, they reacted to this. In verse 29, And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptised with the baptism of John. In other words, there were publicans there, and harlots, as we read at another place. There were people of a lower system of things, brethren and sisters, that had already been baptised of John, and now when they heard the Lord Jesus Christ, they justified God. They said within themselves that God was right. They had accepted that when they were baptised into John. And now they were in a position to accept the Lord. That's what John's baptism was all about, wasn't it? This is the fruition of it here. John said, this is a baptism of repentance in preparation for another baptism which you're going to be baptised with. A baptism of fire of the Holy Spirit. Things which would inspire them and cleanse them, brethren and sisters. That's what it was all about. And here it is. And so those people that had accepted the initial baptism of John now justified God. In what way? Well, they justified God. All flesh is grass, John had said. That was God's opinion. They said, God is right. It is grass. And they acknowledged that. And they were grateful for that. Because now they got things into their right perspective. They saw themselves as they really were and they were in a position now to declare God to be righteous and to allow him to work in their lives. And because they had been baptised of John, they were ready now to listen to the Messiah. But, says the next verse, the Pharisees and lawyers, and I want to read the margin, brethren and sisters, for the two marginal re renditions you've got here. You read the margin. But the Pharisees and the lawyers frustrated 
within themselves the counsel of God, being not baptised of him. And you can see what's happening. They frustrated within themselves the counsel of God because they were not baptised of John. And you can imagine them standing in that crowd. They had just seen him raise the widow's son. They, that fame had gone round the whole of Judea. Many of them would have followed him. Now they watched him in a frenzy of activity perform miracle after miracle after miracle to impress John's disciples. They would have stood in absolute awe of this man. They just got a tongue lashing second to none that put them right back in their place and then got a remarkable encouragement from a man who was not just simply angry for angry's sake, but calmed himself to a degree that he encouraged them in the midst of his anger, they would have been absolutely impressed. And within themselves, they couldn't help but be impressed. They think, what a wonderful man. He can raise the dead. He can perform these miracles. He can stand there and tell people off in a most vehement and withering way. And in the same breath, he can encourage them and to help them in the kingdom of God. And within themselves, they would know that he was a man that was doing everything that they couldn't do. And deep down inside, they knew that he was a son of God. But they hadn't been baptised of John. They hadn't taken their opportunity. And now, and now to come out and to say it now, it would be rather awkward, wouldn't it? It would be rather embarrassing. Because where is John? He's in prison. He's not now a golden voice on the banks of the River Jordan. He's in a dungeon. What do you do now? And they'd be wrestling with these feelings within themselves. Wrestling and wrestling. But the pride, brethren and sisters, too much to come out and say, look, we should have been baptised with the others. We should have listened to John. We should have been prepared, but we're not prepared. And to come out and admit that was too much. And they frustrated the counsel of God inside and you know and I know brethren and sisters that is almost a daily occurrence with us we know what's right we know the benefits that accrue from obeying God we know the the goodness of God in giving us his son and all the benefits that come as a result of our knowing the truth and of the brethren and sisters and we know what we ought to do in response to that And we feel that if we don't respond to that, it's not only a question of disobeying of God, it's a question of being absolutely showing ourselves in in a sense of base ingratitude. But we wrestle with that within ourselves. Because the way to show gratitude and respond is going to mean a hurt, a sacrifice, a giving up, of doing something we don't want to do. And we wrestle with those feelings. The Apostle said this in the Galatians. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I don't frustrate the grace of God. You think of that expression. If we take nothing away from the night, think of that expression. Frustrating within ourselves the grace of God. It isn't only a question of failing to obey God. That's not the point. The point is that God's grace is inducing us to come into the kingdom. It's drawing us on. God is bearing in upon us in so many ways to try and get us to respond to his goodness. And in that, in the ways that he's going about it is a good way, it's a gracious way, it's a lovely way. And we frustrate that. It must grieve our Heavenly Father to see that done, brethren and sisters. And then because these people were frustrating the grace of God, Jesus gave them a little parable. Where unto life shall I liken the men of this generation? And he would look at these scribes and Pharisees who were struggling within themselves, knowing what they heard was right, but too proud to say it, and fighting that feeling down and their flesh becoming paramount in them. And he says, what will I liken the men of this generation to? Well, he said, you're like children in the marketplace. You know, brethren and sisters, it's from this type of thing that we get our word allegory. The Greek word for, is a a word allegory, is used in Galatians, isn't it? When Paul speaks about the two women, this is an allegory. What's an allegory? Well, the Greek word for market is agora. An allegory is a word which means to speak in the market. And you see, Paul's word came from a practice which if you read any history of the times, you'll understand. It wasn't only in the land of, Middle, uh, of, the, of uh, Israel that this happened, but all over the Middle East. This was a custom of the time. that They didn't have, of course, shops on every street corner. They had their vast markets, open markets, where they brought their produce, and they all went down there to buy or to bark or whatever to get their supplies. And so mother and father and the children would go on the open market days. 
And while mother and father were engaged in procuring for the household all the necessary needs, what would the children do? Well, they would get in little groups and have games. It was a time of rejoicing. They'd meet their friends. And they'd run down there and they'd, they'd probably only once a week or whatever they had them, they'd meet their friends and they would really enjoy those times. And so the children were in the custom of playing games in the market. Allegory. And they'd tell their stories. And they would play the games. Jesus makes mention of two of them here. They played funerals and they played weddings. And he says, you're like the children. They call one to another saying, we have piped unto you, you have not danced. And we've mourned unto you, you have not wept. And so here's two groups of children and one little group of, of children saying, let's play weddings and we'll have a festivity. No, we want to play funerals. All right then, we'll play funerals. Well, now we want to play weddings. Isn't that like children? And they changed their mind, you see. Whatever one suggested, they'd go the opposite. And they said, well, fair enough, we'll do it. No, no, well, we'll do what you said first. And so I go on. Just stupidity, really. Childlike stupidity. He said, that's what you're like. Why were they like that? He said, because John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. You say, he's got a devil. The son of man comes eating and drinking. You say, a gluttonous man, a friend of sinners and, and, uh, and publicans. You can't win. You cannot win. So John's abstinence, brethren and sisters, from the delicacies of life, offended them because they liked their good meals. Jesus comes along and he openly eats and enjoys his meals with the people that he ate with and they said, oh, a public, a, a gluttonous man. You can't win. He said, you're just like those children in the markets. And then he said a wonderful thing. Verse 35. But wisdom is justified of all her children. That's Proverbs 8. Have a look at it. You see, there were all sorts of children in that marketplace. I think this is absolutely wonderful. That's Proverbs 8. Wisdom is justified of her children. And so wisdom was in the markets, brothers and sisters. There she was. Proverbs 8, verse 1. He says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of the high places, by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming into the doors. She's everywhere. She's in the markets, isn't she? Wisdom. And she's justified of her children. Well, look at verse 33, or verse 32. Now therefore she says, Hearken unto me, O ye children. For blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favour of Yahweh. Wisdom is justified of her children. How do they justify wisdom? How do you justify anyone's wisdom, brethren and sisters? How do you justify anyone's wisdom. How does the children of wisdom justify her wisdom? In exactly the same way as those publicans and harlots justified God. Doing what he said. Now look, if someone comes to you and said, or you go to them and you say, now look, I'm in trouble. I'd like a bit of advice. Here's the problem. You outline the problem. The brother would think about it and he'd come back and he'd say, well look, I've thought about that. I think the wisest course for you to take is this. Now, if you really believe that's the wisest course to take, if you really believe that that brother thought that out well, and that you'd never thought of that, but you can see clearly that that's the way to go, you know the way to justify that wisdom? Do it! Don't go around telling people he's a wise man. Don't go around and telling people what the, the sort of wisdom you heard and the way that he deduced it. Go and practice it. There's only one way to justify anybody's wisdom, and that's to do it. And that really justifies it. Brothers and sisters, talking about it and not doing it is not to justify it. Wisdom is justified of her children because her children actually go about doing what wisdom said. And that's what Jesus said. You're like children in the marketplace. You don't do what anybody says. John came along with his brand of wisdom and you called him a devil. I come along with mine. You say, a gluttonous man. He didn't justify either of us. But the publicans and the harlots justified God because they were baptised of John. God said, all flesh is grace. They thought about it, and they thought, well, when you think about it, it is. 
There's not an instinct in our body that's any good. The whole thing is shot through with these propensities, which all of them would tend to death. The flesh is grass. They got into the water. They justified God's wisdom in telling him that. They learned a lesson. And they prepared to accept it. That's what wisdom's children do, brethren and sisters. And so the Lord finished that little section by telling them that. That whilst they were acting like those ir- irresponsible, immature children, who would never be told anything but do the opposite, Nonetheless, there was in the streets, in the marketplaces, at the open doors, at the gates, and all over Israel, the voice of wisdom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And his children justified him if they do what he says.